Hi there, this is Valentine and welcome to this Scrum webinar recording. There was a problem, a technical problem while recording the webinar and the first part of the webinar got lost. So just in a few slides, I wanted to explain to you what this webinar was about. So in the beginning, uh, just talking about general things you should know about a PSM1 and a PSP01 exam, preparation tips, exam tips, and most of the webinar is simply the live Q&A. You will find in the video description the timestamp so that you can jump to different parts of the webinar without watching the entire thing. I hope you'll enjoy it. So when we're discussing the exams, I'm talking here about the PSM1 exam and the PSP01 exam. Both are similar, but um, they also have a few different aspects that they focus on. Um, so when we're talking about the PSM1 exam, it costs $150 per attempt and the product owner certification is $200 per attempt. Per attempt simply means that you take the exam, you pass it, you get a certification. If for whatever reason you fail it, you have to pay the $150 or the $200 once again in order to have another attempt. Of course, you will not need this because you are registered in the course. You are learning Scrum the right way and will have no problems. The requirements are pretty straightforward. There are practically no requirements compared to other organizations that have Scrum certifications. You do not have to attend any courses in order to get the exam, in order to attend the exam, actually. So from that point of view, scrum.org is a very, very nice and affordable way of getting this exam. And because many of you have asked this, this is an open book online exam. It is not advertised as such, but you are practically taking this exam from the comfort of your home or your office or wherever you're taking the exam. There's absolutely nobody that can check what you're doing. You can open other tabs in your browser or anything like that. In practice, you really do not have a lot of time. So my recommendation is not to rely on I'll search it up in the Scrum Guide or I'll search it up online because you can get hung up in searching for stuff, but at the same time, you will not be able to follow along with the rest of the questions that are in the exam. So just a heads up there. Yes, it's an open book online exam, but at the same time, it's the kind of exams where it doesn't really help you a lot. If you encounter a question that you don't know, well, I don't think that a Scrum Guide will instantly help you in a matter of 60 seconds or so. Nevertheless, the passing score is 85%. You have a time limit of 60 minutes. And in this 60 minutes, you have to answer 80 questions. So as you can see, the time per question is not particularly high. So this is why you have to be pretty quick and already be familiar with the subject of Scrum. The question format is pretty similar to what you see inside the course but also to the open assessments on scrum.org. This means you have multiple choice. So you have to select only one answer. It can be also multiple answers. Most of the time it's indicated, select the best two answers, select the best three answers and so on. Only a few questions do not indicate how many answers are expected. And there are also a few true or false questions. So there is a mix of all of them. What's also important to notice in the interface is that when you are taking the exam, you must attempt every question. You cannot skip them. I actually recommend that when you're seeing a question that you already make your choice, assume that you will not have time to come back to that specific question. For questions that only require one answer, in that case, you will not be left, you, you cannot skip, you cannot proceed to the next question. But if, for example, the question requires you to select two answers or it's like select the best two answers and you select only one, you can still go to the next question. So we're not prompt you, hey, you haven't selected the expected number of answers. That's super important to remember. And also for questions that can have multiple answers, you do not get any partial points. So if there are two answers that are correct and you get only one of them, regardless of you 
don't select the second one or you make a decision that is wrong, you will not get any partial points there. And after you pass the certification, it's yours for your entire professional life. It doesn't expire. You do not need to renew it or anything like this. You have demonstrated once that you know how Scrum works and then everything is absolutely fine. You do not have to renew it. Many organizations ask you to earn points or renew your certification every two years just so they can charge you some additional money for that. But this is not the case with scrum.org. So again, a big advantage for doing their certification here. I know that many of you are not native English speakers. And unfortunately, some of the questions in the exam are not focusing so much on Scrum or understanding the contents of the Scrum guide, but understanding the English language. And I think that's quite unfortunate, but this is how things go. You cannot copy paste questions in order to translate them. So I personally, if I need to translate something, I have other translators, but I typically need to copy and paste the text to get a good translation. You can use the Google Translate plugin. My experience with the Google Translate plugin hasn't been very good overall. So it, especially for this kind of questions where you need to have an exact understanding of what's being asked, the Google Translate plugin may confuse you in the translation. So this is just something to keep in mind. But nevertheless, you can install it, or if there are any browser plugins that translate a page for you, they should work. And you can test if they work by doing any of the Scrum open assessments. And you'll find open assessments linked throughout the course in the form of assignments. And you can check there if the Google Translate plugin works. So the interface of the exam is practically the same as the one for the open assessments on scrum.org. There's no notable, uh, notable difference on how the interface looks like. And most likely, if the Google Translate plugin works on the open assessments, it will work on the exam as well. So you can practice with this in advance to have an idea if it will work on the exam without wasting time when the exam started to try things out or to notice that something doesn't work. Additionally, as you, if you look closely at the interface for the open assessment, you'll notice that there's no option to mark a question for review. And this means that you need to have pen and paper available so that you can write down which questions you want to review. And then in that case, uh, what you need to do is to go back to the list of questions that are below the main question that you're viewing, the current question, to put it like that and then to manually click on it. So definitely I recommend practicing a bit with the interface, going back to other questions and understanding what happens, how this navigation altogether works, because it's super important. It will save you some time during the exam. Now, many of you are most likely in the preparation phase. You're most likely taking the course, doing practice tests, reading the Scrum guide, trying to understand what's happening, attending webinars and asking questions. And that's super good. I just wanted to point out a few things that you should be doing, but also a few things that in my opinion, you shouldn't be doing. So I'm gonna start with the kind of things that you should be focusing on. And I'm saying that while the course is not perfect, it definitely contains a clear path for you to follow. And you can trust me because the course has been taken by many, many students. And every single day I'm getting messages from students who have passed the exam or sometimes have passed both exams. And they tell me that the contents of the course is all right. It helps a lot. There's no information that mis is misleading or it really focuses on the most important things. And of course, the most important things are the following, is to focus on the open assessments on scrum.org. In the real exam, you may even find a few questions that are the same as the ones in the open assessments. And you should have absolutely no issues doing the open assessments in just a few minutes. And you'll notice that many questions are the same if you're repeating the assessment, but 
do the open assessments until you have a 100% score. But also do the practice tests in the course until you have almost 100% score. And for both the open assessments and the practice tests, it's important that you go and take a look at every question, even the ones that you have answered correctly, and read the explanation for the question. Read the explanation because it's super important. And additionally, especially for the questions where you had mistakes, read the explanation and go back to the Scrum Guide and read that particular part of the Scrum Guide that apparently you didn't understand so well. And really dedicate some time really trying to understand what's the con- what is the contents of the Scrum Guide in that particular section. So if, for example, you had some issues understanding what are what is the role of the Scrum Master, then you would go to the Scrum Master part of the Scrum, Scrum Guide and you will read that and try to, again, to understand and to go look at the question again and try to match those together, the Scrum Guide on one side and what's being asked in the test. Additionally, it's super important that you invest time reading the Scrum Guide. And the Scrum Guide is, on one side it is short, but it contains really a lot of details in just a few pages. So I think it's super important that you read it more than just two times. And you don't have to read it like from the beginning to the end. You can focus on only specific parts. So let's say the definition of that is not so clear. Don't look for answers somewhere else regarding definition of done. Your first and primary source of information is the Scrum Guide. So go in the Scrum Guide and read that. Go back to the course and watch the respective lecture again. And then attempt more practice tests regarding this. So the Scrum Guide is the source of information, not the practice test. You shouldn't be learning from practice tests. And by saying that, I'm going to the kind of things that you shouldn't be doing. And I noticed some of you like over-preparing, trying to do like a lot of questions, like instead of really focusing on the Scrum Guide, try to do every preparation test that there's available for PSM1 or PSP01. And that's not really the purpose because in the exam, you don't know exactly what kind of questions you'll be getting. You may get similar questions to questions you've seen on simulations. But at the same time, what's being tested is actually your understanding of the Scrum Guide. And trust me, if you do the course, if you do the open assessments, and if you do the practice tests in the course, is more than enough to pass the exam. They go over the entire contents of the Scrum Guide. This is super important. Again, I know that many websites publish some questions for PSM1. Some of these questions, or more, more of these, a lot of these questions, do not have an explanation. So this forces you on one, on one side to remember something that you don't know exactly who posted that question. Why is the answer B and not D? And typically different and unreliable sources of questions can get you confused and can really make you unsure because, as I previously said, you're not focusing on the Scrum Guide and the contents of the Scrum Guide, you're learning from doing practice tests. And while practice tests are important, I would say the Scrum Guide is even more important because if you understand the Scrum Guide, it doesn't really matter the kind of questions that you get in. It doesn't matter that in the exam, you will get questions you haven't seen before, the kind of questions you haven't seen before, because you know the Scrum Guide and you know how to use it. So be be very aware of this pitfall. If you invest a lot of time into this, it may not be the best use of your time, not the best use of your money. And just to reemphasize the practice tests within the course and the open assessments from scrum.org and all the assignments that take you step by step in the course are sufficient for passing the exam. You do not need anything else. Definitely do not need something to confuse you. Okay. And you should be trusting me because I really have a lot of experience with many students who have taken the course and 
think that the course worked for them and managed to get the certification. And as I said, they came back to me and said, hey, what's inside the course is really solid. It works for me. And I think almost every day there's somebody who's uh, passing the exam with a 100% score. So I think that speaks a lot. So you're taking the course, you're doing all these practice assignments, practice tests, and you may still be unsure what to do. Should I attempt the exam now or should I wait another week or what should I do? And typically my advice is because you have only focused on the open assessments and on the contents of the course and the practice tests in the course. This is enough to pass the exam and you should be getting an almost perfect score at this once. So typically in the beginning, maybe you will get like 70% and then it will improve. It will be 85. So you'll start to pass and then you will get 90%. You know? And maybe you have 90%, you're wondering, well, I'm, am I ready now? And I typically say, well, with... 80%, 85, 90%, you're, you're not ready. You, you theoretically pass the exam. And if you attempt the real one, you may just as well pass it. But at the same time, it may not be enough. So 90% score in the practice test indicates that there are still topics that aren't clear. And what I mean by that is that you should identify which kind of questions do you get wrong? And then go back to the, to the Scrum Guide and try to understand again why maybe there's something unclear. And I know that the Scrum Guide is sometimes super confusing in some aspects. And this is why I'm here. If you look in the Q&A section in the course, you'll notice that there are tons and tons of questions. And I'm there for you to clarify anything that may be unclear. And anyway, all the practice questions take you through the entire contents of the Scrum Guide and every question gives you an explanation. But this is super important. So to identify which parts are still unclear and to invest time not doing more practice tests or repeating the same practice tests until you memorize the question, but until you understand the Scrum Guide. So you should see these practice tests as you never seen them before. You like you shouldn't do them so often that you already know the questions in advance without actually reading the contents. So you should be using them not so much. But when you're using them, make sure that you reach for this almost 100% score because this typically, I would say, almost guarantees, almost guarantees that you will have no issues in the exam because you have understood the Scrum Guide, not because you have memorized some questions, okay? Now, assuming that now the preparation phase is over, I also have some exam tips for you. So the exam tips are, you could say, rather obvious. So you shouldn't be taking the exam when you're tired. I typically prefer to take such exams always in the morning. Don't do practice tests till late in the night. Don't try to like over prepare before the exam itself. That's not really the point. And additionally, during the exam, as I pointed out, you have 60 minutes and 80 questions. So there's not a lot of time. So you should be super prepared. Always keep track um, how things are progressing. You may notice that in the actual exam, you need a bit more time than you have used in the practice test. So this is something to keep in mind. And additionally, you are sometimes a bit more stressed. It's, this is the real exam. You now pay the money. This is the real thing. So this can add up to a bit of, let's say, overall not being so careful with your time. So just be aware of this. Um, and as I mentioned from the interface, there's no way to mark which questions you want to review. So that's super important. So you should have pen, paper, you shouldn't 
actually get up from your desk when you're taking the exam. So make sure that you have water. If you think you need any sweets or something to eat during the exam, if your sugar level drops, and also that your computer is plugged in. So you don't want to run out of the electricity in the middle of the exam. I know that some of you may have a bit of an unreliable internet connection. If the internet connection should drop, don't have to worry about this. If you can reconnect, then you can resume the exam, but the time that you were offline will still be subtracted from the total time. So say, for example, you have been five minutes um, offline and you still had half an hour to go when this happened, you will only have 25 minutes to go. So you can still resume the test. If you have some problems loading the next page or something happens, you can still reload the page and you should be able to continue the exam. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but just in case it happens, if you know that you have an unreliable internet connection, don't panic. You know, try to, try to do your best with, with what's given in that current situation. And also, and this doesn't happen to all students and may also be related to the time of the day you're taking the exam. I had it. I know that other students reported as well. You may notice a delay. So you're clicking to get the next questions and it takes one second, two seconds, three seconds. Sometimes it can take up to five seconds on, on such to load. So in that case, don't panic, wait a bit for the next question to load. Most likely the next question that you have will load a bit faster. There's no reason to panic, expect that this may happen. If it doesn't happen, lucky you, that's perfect. If it does happen, that's all right. Many students report this happening. I even had students reporting it. I, I did a PSM1 exam, it didn't happen. Then I took the PSPO1 exam, then it happened. So there's, I, I cannot say that there's a pattern or something like this, but just expect something like this to happen and overall remain calm. Now, how to deal with exam questions? And it's super important that even if you think you have seen that question somewhere else, even if you think that you know the answer, even if the question seems pretty simple, pretty short, or whatever, read the entire question carefully. And also, don't start selecting answers until you have, you can even put your mouse over it, how many answers are expected. You would think that this is super obvious, but you might find your, yourself in the exam selecting answers without actually reading the question, question carefully or without reading how many answers are expected just because you think that this may be the correct thing to do. Additionally, for some of the questions, it's important to think about the contents of the Scrum Guide. So the exam itself doesn't ask your personal opinion regarding some situations that are described there. The Scrum exam doesn't want to know how would you solve a specific problem if you were the Scrum Master or the product owner. No, this is not what's being asked. So overall, you always have to think about the contents of the Scrum Guide. You always have to think about what kind of formulations, what kind of words are being used in the Scrum Guide and which of these words can be found in the options that are given to you. So overall, I would say don't trust your gut. Don't trust your instinct on this one. Always think about when you're unsure about the question. Think about the contents of the Scrum Guide. Think about the Scrum rules, okay? It's super important. This can really help you during the exam. Additionally, in the exam, you are supposed to select the best answer. The best answer isn't always the perfect answer. And you will also notice this in some of the preparation questions. You're given with a scenario and you're given with a list of possible answers. So sometimes things are not exactly as in the Scrum Guide, but 
still from the options that are given, you need to select the best answer or the best answers that are available. And typically the best answers are the one that do not break any scrum rules. So if you find an answer that is definitely against the scrum guide, that cannot be the best answer, even if part of it may sound okay. And for questions where you're really unsure, you should be taking a process of elimination. And what I mean by that is, say, for example, you have five possible options and you need to select two of them. But most of the time, you will be able, by looking at each individual option, to find something in the answer that is against the Scrum Guide. So you can like visually and mentally like eliminate those answers. So, for example, from five options, you can eliminate two quite easily. And then you will left with three options. And from, from those three options, you need to select two. Now, typically, one of them is like super clear. You're definitely sure that that's the right one. And then you have two options, like a 50-50 chance. This can really help you like narrow down what you need to select and then look at only those specific two answers and think, okay, from these two answers, which of them is the best answer that adheres to what's being said in the Scrum Guide and adheres to what I know about Scrum overall and doesn't have a relation with my own Scrum experience in the organization, doesn't have uh, anything with what I think should be the right thing to do. This can really help you um, select then the best answer in the exam. Now, there are quite a few people that have joined here, and I know that this audience is quite international. So I'll give you a few seconds. I would really love to hear from where you guys are from. If you can write in the chat uh, your country, the city, region, from where you are, I would really love to do that. And I'll take just a few seconds of break to drink some water, and then we'll start the Q&A section. We're going to get started with the live Q&A. Hopefully, the first part of the webinar wasn't boring. Uh, if I'm noticing correctly, there are already a few questions that probably are related already to uh, what I've been talking before. So somebody asked if there's any negative marking. No, you don't simply do not get points for anything that you haven't answered correctly. Uh, the top three resources for practice questions, uh, I would say the open assessments, um, any of my uh, Scrum courses for the Scrum Master or the Product Owner, and Mikhail Lapshkin questions are also relatively decent. So I would say those are the best ways, and uh, two of them, of course, are also free, so you do not need to pay anything extra. What's the difference between CSM and PSM? Um, both are just as well recognized. Uh, in a nutshell, I would say that for CSM, um, you need to attend one of the courses. Typically, a course costs um, more or less 1,000 US dollars, typically a bit more. Uh, from what I know, I don't have a CSM certification, but from what I know, the exam itself is much easier. So it, both are just as well recognized. Uh, both are from the founders of Scrum. So let's say if your company is paying for uh, for the training, then you know it doesn't really make a difference. But if you're paying for it, probably the certifications from scrum.org, they are much more affordable. Um, cleared the PSM exam yesterday, want to take the PSP01 as well. Um, what I recommend. So typically, it really depends on the PSM1 score that you have. So in that case, uh, if you had like a really high score PSM1, uh, let's say above 95%, then uh, with a bit of preparation without taking any additional courses, uh, if you read the EBM guide, then you'll be able to pass the PSP01 exam as well. But you know, to attempt the PSP01, PSM1 has to be like, it has to be super clear. So uh, otherwise, uh, I also have a course and I'm not trying to sell more courses, but if you want to take the course as well, if you're unsure, if your PSM1 result wasn't that high, the certifications themselves are pretty similar. 
this is why the contents of the courses are pretty similar. The practice tests are different and overall the kind of assignments that you do throughout the course are a bit different. But altogether, the, both certifications are quite similar. And especially if you're just getting started with Scrum, if you don't know in which direction you're going, if you're not already established like a product owner or from this product management perspective or on the other side, uh, as a Scrum master, you want to have like more opportunities open, then it would make sense to take both certifications. Otherwise, yeah. And yes, the EBM guide um, is super important. In the PSP01 exam, typically a few, two or three questions are directly from the EBM guide. So should be a bit, um, should dedicate some time to understanding the EBM guide as well. Okay, so scrolling down here. Somebody else is being, uh, for PSP01, how important is to focus on the Nexus guide? The Nexus guide is not an official material neither for PSM1 or for PSP01. Um, the entire contents that is regarding scalability in Scrum so scale scrum is not related to the nexus guide it's most of it based on general scrum rules and only a few ideas i can say that they are part of the nexus guide overall what's being said in the course is more than enough you do not need to get confused with the nexus guide um, as well so a few people have been waiting and have raised their hands so let's hear a few questions before i answer anything else in the chat if I notice here, Chitra, is that correct? Yes. Uh, today I did mock test, and in that I got confused in two questions. Uh, one was that the, in a daily scrum, uh, should be like a scrum master should present or not? And I selected that yes, scrum master should be. But my answer got wrong, and uh, only development team could attend the daily scrum. So sometimes it happens that as far understanding as we are not uh, memorizing everything, we are answering based on our understanding and it got incorrect in mock test. Mm -hmm. okay. that's, that's actually quite a great, quite a great question. And yes, many of you, uh, I know that stumble upon this enough. problem. Okay, sorry. So many of you are a bit confused about what's happening in the daily Scrum. And my first recommendation is to go back to the Scrum guide and read again the daily Scrum section. And you'll notice there that it's not implicit, it's not even explained that the Scrum master attends. So it, the Scrum guide is pretty clear. It says this is an internal development team meeting. So a Scrum Master is part of the Scrum team, but the Scrum Master is not part of the development team. So if you're being asked who should attend daily Scrum, the only possible answer is the development team. Nobody else should attend because there's no reason for anybody else to attend because this meeting is for the development team and only for the development team. Now, because the development team... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but as uh, for the understanding, uh, I thought that the Scrum Master should attend because the Scrum Master will take care of the time box and uh, it will make sure that the team is on track and they are answering those three questions. Though, that the, what we have done yesterday, what we are doing it, are we on a track, what are, the, are there any impediments? So for that, I thought that the Scrum Master should attend meeting otherwise scrum master would not be able to understand that the for doing today's task are there any impediments or not mm -hmm. okay well I, I think you you bring a very important point and you, you said when you answered this is that you you place your understanding and this is more or less your interpretation of what's being said in the scrum guide or overall what you what you think you know about scrum and again this falls back into the into the part of the exam doesn't ask your opinion or your understanding. It asks some facts that are being stated in the Scrum Guide. So if you look back what's being said in the Scrum Guide, first of all, the Scrum Master is indeed responsible for it. It doesn't mean 
uh, and it's only responsible for part of it to be more precise in the, uh, and that is the time box but that doesn't mean that the scrum master must attend the event itself so you can let's say in, in practical terms if the scrum master is not present but is in the same building as everyone else they will be able to see when the development team is starting the daily scrum and it's happening let's say every morning at 10 a.m okay so if they notice that they need uh, till 10 30 to finish the daily scrum then obviously it's not within uh, the time box well doesn't mean that the scrum master has to like go and interrupt the meeting and say okay the time uh, time box is over the scrum master is a coach and a facilitator so he will try to help the development team understand why the time box is important and try to understand why this is not being kept within the time box but it's not like the scrum police and it's coming okay 15 minutes are over everybody out this is not the spirit of scrum when it comes to this additionally another confusion is uh, regarding the third uh, the, the three questions those three questions are just a suggestion which means the development team owns this meeting they decide how to run it so they may not even answer those questions at all and this would be still within the scrum rules because that is only a suggestion it isn't anything else so definitely recommend go back to the scrum guide read that respective portion of the daily scrum reach read each individual word and then i think this will help you better understand in scrum and especially in the exam even a simple word word can totally change the meaning of the question like must attend or oh, the scrum master if the development team is fine with it could attend the product owner could attend as well again if the developer team agrees to this because they own the meeting this is a meeting for them does does it make sense yeah thank you so much yeah i will look into that scrum guide thank you it's okay really no fun. worries this this is where yeah. you should be investing more time okay so let's hear another question from William. Let's see if we... Yeah. Uh, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, how are you? Good. Oh, doing good yourself? Pretty good. Let's see your question. So, yeah, um, during one of your tasks throughout the course, there was this question, multiple choices question, asking me and I will read exact question I get here. Which of the... Which of the following are management roles in the Scrum? So I happen to check there are no management roles in the Scrum. And uh, well, it says that it's incorrect. The correct options are development team, Scrum master, and product owner. For the best of my knowledge, um, Scrum does not recognize management. There's no management um, roles in Scrum. So I was a little bit confused on that. So if you could explain a little bit better. Mm -hmm. That's actually quite a great question. And part of the confusion is that uh, this kind of things could be asked in the exam, but aren't really part of the Scrum Guide. And so what's happening is that, I don't know where the source of the question is. Um, typically, the Scrum Master role is considered to be a management position because the Scrum Master would manage the Scrum implementation. So you can see like the, the, the Scrum Master is not a traditional manager in the sense that it will manage, let's say the development team, or it will check what others are doing or is responsible for the financials or anything like this. No, the, the, the focus of the Scrum Master is how Scrum is implemented. Um, so, Typically, I wouldn't say that the development team is considered to be a management position. Of course, the development team would also manage, uh, for example, what's being done in the, during the sprint. So they would manage the sprint backlog. But other than that, I would not necessarily see the, the development team as a management position in Scrum. But definitely the Scrum Master from this perspective is seen as a management position. 
uh, would be also interesting for the question that you mentioned, if it's not from the course, also to uh, to see the explanation. So um, if if this is something that's still unclear, feel free to reach out in the Q and A section or by sending me a private message. That would be that would be great in order to clarify this. Okay, so let's hear another question from Palash. That's correct. Uh, yeah, it's correct. Hi, everyone. Okay. Hi, how are you? Yeah. Fine. So, yeah, uh, I actually heard one of the senior assistants in our project uh, saying, say, like that uh, uh, we were following Kanban, but now we'll be following Scrum. So, my question is, what is the basic difference? I mean, Kanban is a part of Scrum, right? We are using Azure DevOps uh, application. So, it has a section uh, with boards. So, it was very difficult to. Okay. Well, definitely Scrum and Kanban fall in like on the agile part of doing things, but they are definitely not the same. So just by having something that resembles a Kanban board um, in Scrum doesn't mean that you're doing Kanban. Um, now, in, in Scrum, many teams decide to use either physical or virtual boards that have these columns, like for example, to do, in progress, and done and to use this to organize the work. And this is what we typically call to be like strict uh, within the Scrum Guide. This would be like the contents of the sprint backlog because you will have the items and you will have the plan, which is actually this smaller task, the decomposition of the work. But don't make confusions. They are definitely different things. For example, in Kanban, you may have a limit in terms of working progress. So for example, working progress, let's say it can be only three tasks can be working progress, which means you either have to complete them before start additional work. There isn't something like this in Scrum. Now, what you need to understand is that in the end, Scrum is only a framework. It's not a complete methodology. It's not an entire process that explains you how to do it, which tools to use, and everything. So there are many things that you can build on top of Scrum. So probably this is one of the reasons why it caused a bit of confusion. But when we're talking about pure Scrum, it's only what's being said inside the Scrum Guide. So hopefully that, that makes sense. Definitely in the Scrum Guide, there are no, no Scrum boards mentioned or anything like this. So this is why overall the Scrum framework leaves a lot of things totally open for additional uh, additional things that come on top of it okay so let's hear another question i think it's ashish let's see hello can you hear me hello uh, hello hi hello. sorry uh, uh sorry ashish here i was on mute sorry yeah no, no problem yeah. Hi, Valentin. I had Hi. a question uh, regarding sprint review meeting, uh, where you uh, told the development team will not present uh, uh, the sprint backlog items, which are not done. Uh, I, uh, As I was referring back to the Scrum Guide, it says uh, the development team has an opportunity to present in a review meeting what went well and what did not go well, as well as, well as like, uh, it'll go and... Uh, 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 and it'll all it will always propose uh, like uh, the problems that they have faced during the sprint review. So this this particular thing was a bit confusing. For the items which are not done in sprint backlog, should they be presented in sprint review meeting or should they just go into product backlog? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and it definitely relates to like really focusing on what's actually being asked. Because if you compare what has been done and what hasn't been done, and you use the same word, like for example, present or demonstrate, then the idea is that you, you demonstrate what has been done, but you definitely do not demonstrate or present what hasn't been done. And this is to eliminate confusion towards the stakeholders regarding what's actually being expected. So just to give an example, if the development team would demonstrate something, let's say they have built uh, added a payment method to the e-commerce platform, you can now pay with PayPal, but that is that respective item is not done. It's only like on a test system or something like this. So it's not considered done. Then the stakeholders may look at this and say, oh, this PayPal thing is pretty cool. Oh, it seems to work. 
oh, and I would expect it to be then in the next release that's maybe coming next week. So, and this will not be the case because the item is actually not done. It, it's still something is missing according to the definition of done. So for that reason, you are right. In the sprint review, it will be mentioned what has been done and what has not been done. But in, in terms of what has, hasn't been done, it will only be said, look, we haven't finished this PayPal integration. We haven't improved the performance and we haven't done that. So that everyone knows what has been done and what has been done is demonstrated, but what hasn't been done is mentioned, but not presented, not demonstrated. And of course, typically, if it hasn't been done at all, so there's absolutely no work that has been done, there's also nothing to show. So this may be uh, may, may the reason for the confusion. And typically, um, you need to really pay attention in the context, how, what's the intention of the question? Is the intention of in the direction of demonstration of presented, or is it just like sort of like mentioned? Okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay, Thanks. perfect. No worries. We also have Vicky. Hello, can you hear me? Oh. This is Vicky. Hi, Vicky. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I apologize. I didn't know what happened there for a moment. No um, problem. I, I, did, um, I did attempt the exam, and I remember that then I, I scored 83.8. I was really, really upset about it. And I contacted you, and um, you were so kind. I had to give you that, like, your, your courses are great. And you were really kind. You wanted me to um, let you know what I encountered and all that. But I was going through a lot of stuff there. And so I really couldn't get back to you. And um, I was under a lot of pressure. This is what I found out. I was under a lot of pressure. Um, I needed to travel and I wanted to take the exam before going to deal with what I had to go and deal with because I knew I was going to be devastated if things turned awry. Um, so, yeah, I took the exam. I was under pressure. So I scored 83.8. I was still, I was very upset because I thought that, wait, I'd spent so long to prepare. I had no business failing that exam. So after a few days, I contacted um, scrum.org. The, they were quite nice. Uh, it turned out, okay, so I had encountered a few questions from software development architecture. Mm -hmm. so, so I thought that the reason that I failed the exam was because the, the very first question that I um, that I, I had, number one question, had to do with software development architecture. And I thought to myself, whoa, uh, what is this? I had no idea what <laughs> to do that. I didn't know what to what it think or what to do. Um, it turned out that I was going to have as many as, I think there were about seven, either six or seven questions. Mm -hmm. that had to do with software development architecture. Okay, that's so, quite a lot. Yeah, that was a lot. And I couldn't understand why. So when I failed the exam, I thought that that was why I failed. So I got mm -hmm. upset. I queried them. And this was the response that I got. I actually scored all, I actually scored all of those questions. I, I scored like every point for each of the software development architecture questions. Mm -hmm. And I could not understand how and i did ask the lady i said to her i said well i wasn't supposed to have encountered those questions she said but you you scored all of them so well i don't know i don't know if that, that was a miracle or some i don't know what happened but it turned out that the questions the questions that i failed were actually questions that i shouldn't have failed at all these were questions that i knew the answers to I believe okay. that because I had a lot of my mind and I was rushing through, um, I didn't read all the questions to the end in some cases. I believe that that was what happened. Or mm -hmm. I just mistakenly, because my, um, my laptop is touch, um, touch screen, has touch screen and it's very sensitive. Okay. So I, I might have tapped the wrong um, um, options, at, you know, when it came to some some of the questions. I understand. And I'm I'm super sorry that you you had some issues. Um, we're running a bit out of time. Do you have a question right now that I can? Uh... Now, now this is this is the this is the um, this this is what I got eventually from them mm -hmm. on leadership on leadership styles. I scored zero percent, and I couldn't tell what questions they were. 
Mm-hmm. On coaching and mentoring, I scored 66.7. On artifacts, I scored 66.7. On empiricism, I scored 60. On product value, I, no, I scored everything there. Um, stakeholders and customers, I scored 66.7. Product um, backlog management, I scored 50%. The issue is I don't know what questions um, you know, fell under these categories that I missed because I had no way of reviewing them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, so what I- um, if, if I understand your question correctly or what you're asking is what should you do next? And what I recommend is exactly what uh, I've been talking about, especially in the beginning of these webinars. And also, if you're students of the course, then just follow along with the course content and follow along with all the advice that I'm giving in the course. And that will be more than enough in order to to pass the exam. So you shouldn't be attempting the exam if you are not scoring the highest score possible at assessments within the course and the open assessments. Typically, the kind of like architecture or infrastructure questions, there are only a few questions and it's not really worth like uh, thinking too much about them. Uh, I can tell you um, in a nutshell, architecture, infrastructure, technical debt, anything that is related to the product will be done in parallel to working at any other business functionality. So there's nothing spectacular about them. We just always have to think which are the scrum rules. There are no special rules for architecture. There are no special rules for anything else. Okay. I uh, wanted to take also other people. So if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, in the Q&A section or by sending me a private message. I'll be more than happy to help you with any other questions that you have regarding the exam. I uh, wanted to hear from John as well. John, are you there? Uh, I am. Uh, hi. Yeah. So I'm going to probably do this really quick. So uh, you said that we should not try to over prepare ourselves. Uh, but then again, when you go and try to look for resources from question, and I don't think so, I'm the only one, any place I find that, hey, they have a library of questions, I try to attempt them. So really the question I have is, is there a uh, recommendation from your side that we should stick to five resources out there, like your top five or your top three that you could maybe uh, give us, that that's a good source. And those are the questions that could really help us uh, to practice uh, and uh, just test ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, John, I understand this uh, this like desire of practicing as much as possible and going into the exam with like 100% certainty. But the underlying knowledge that you need to have is about the Scrum Guide. So, I my opinion is that if you focus only on what's inside the course, you will be saving yourself a lot of time because this will really help you understand like also some weird parts of the Scrum Guide, but also to understand the basics. This is typically more than enough. Um, typically, I told you the, the issue with other question sets is not that they are not f- from me or that you have to pay money to somebody else. That's not a problem. I don't have an issue with that. The problem is that most of the time, the quality of these questions is not so good. And if you look in the Q&A section, you will notice students that ask questions that are from different sources and are confused about the answers. Sometimes there are explanations that are totally wrong, actually. Some of them are like very vague and vague, and then provide you with any really like insights. So this is the reason why I would say you're wasting a lot of time. Instead of searching for other questions, the time is much better invested reading the Scrum Guide and going over such, as you've seen in the previous questions, even like this kind of things, like where does it say that the development team doesn't have to answer these two questions? That is just a suggestion. Where does it say that, I don't know, the Scrum Master is not explicit that he has to ask to attend? So these kind of things, if you read them, um, in the Scrum Guide, then you will have a better understanding than trusting someone else who said, trust me, this is the correct answer. So this is the reason why I'm, uh, I'm saying that this is more than enough. Focus more on studying the Scrum Guide. In addition to this, I also know that some of these questions are not correct. So it's only given, this is the question, correct answer is B, Y, no idea. And just this gets you confused and you're wasting more time in, like figuring out this kind of thing. So hopefully it's it's helpful. Probably um, I'm, I also have this information from a lot of students who have passed the exam only, only using these resources. I also know that 
others are like doing as many questions as possible but it goes into like this you could typically prepare for this exam in even like two weeks and if you set for yourself a deadline you you do everything that's in the course you set yourself the deadline you take the exam you pass it and you move on to other things but you can also spend like two months preparing so it's definitely up to you there I think there are also other things that are worth investing time, not only this particular exam. Um, wanted to hear from Obi as well. Hi, Obi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you live, loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Let's hear your question. Fantastic. So my question involves, um, you know, having um, multiple teams developing multiple products using Scrum. Yeah. Now, I know for a fact that if you have multiple teams developing one product, then, you know, you just have one product owner, you know, but however, when it comes to multiple products, like two or three products, you know, I was doing the practice test and I saw a comment, you know, one of the answers where you said a person can have, you know, can be the product owner for three different products, but that does not mean that all the products have only one product owner. Now, that is, I, I, can you shed more light on what you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Well, you need to understand that the Scrum Guide is talking about roles, not talking about person. Now, we're typically making the, let's say, the mistake that when we're referring to the product owner, we're referring to him or her as a person, but not as a role. So a person, for example, you could be the product owner for product A, but could can be the scrum master in a totally different project for that's building project b and so on so i think it's important to understand like this distinction between a person and the role itself because sometimes the question can be really confusing because they they don't um, make this explicit that doesn't say john is product owner um, while building product A and he's also product owner for building product B. Now, the important rule that you need to remember is related to the role. So, for example, the most important rule to remember is that for one product, there can only be one product backlog and there can only be one product owner. Now, if you have three products, of course, each individual product will have let's say at least a scrum team and that scrum team will have a product owner as a role but that particular role can be played by the same person so if you have three three products you can have three persons three different persons having the product owner role but you can just as well have a single person who has the product owner role in those three products so i think maybe this is the the source of confusion does does it make sense yeah, yeah got it now Got it now. So it's about the role, yeah. So one person can be the product owner for multiple roles, or the company could decide to get different people to play that role of the product owner. Yeah, yeah, and this would still be within the Scrum rules. Now, of okay. course, it's it's not ideal to have a person like handle a lot of products because it's only one person in the end. But strictly uh, looking at the Scrum rules, that would be possible. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Perfect. Let's hear from William as well. He's been waiting for a bit. Hi, William. Can you hear, can you hear me? me? Perfect. Hi. Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, also a second question I have during one of the practice tests, this, this, there, there was this question, the key stakeholders are unsure what the development team will be working on the next sprint. Who is responsible for the lack of transparency? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the, the the one I chose was a product owner and development team because I was envisioning, you know, uh, there was lack of transparency in the two artifacts, mm -hmm. mobile, the product backlog, and the sprint backlog. But it happens that the correct answer is product owner. So mm -hmm. uh, can you can you elaborate a little bit sure. more on that? Yeah, it's, um, it's another great question and often a source of confusion. So if you... Uh, after this webinar, if you go back to the sprint review meeting, this is where the interaction with the stakeholders is quite explicit. And you will see in that particular part of the Scrum Guide that this group will inspect the product backlog. And the product backlog is the source of information because 
if somebody within the organization or the stakeholders or anybody else wants to know what will happen next, what's, what's, the, what's next on the agenda, the product backlog is the main source of information because there the product backlog is ordered. So anyone can take a look and see, okay, most likely in the next sprint, the development team will be working on feature A, will be fixing this defect and will be working on this. So this is why the development team is not directly responsible for anything uh, regarding this transparency part towards the key stakeholders because they don't have a role. They only manage the sprint backlog. And this is something that's typically, it can be transparent towards the stakeholders, but it's not the main artifact that's being used to understand what's happening next. So at the, this is a sprint review meeting, they look at a, a product backlog and they sort of like make an educated guess what will happen in the next sprint. So this is why the best answer in that case is the product owner. The product owner manages the product backlog. The sprint backlog is just the artifact that's being created from the product backlog itself. So if the product backlog isn't clear, then the sprint backlog cannot be clear. But as I said, this is not what will be typically inspected by the by the stakeholders. So again, my advice, read the sprint review because this will, you will see it will mention uh, that the entire group will look at the product backlog and figure out what to do next. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So indirectly, that means that stakeholders, either key or general stakeholders, shouldn't be inspecting directly the sprint backlog, but the product backlog and also during the inspection during the, the sprint review. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we, we say in Scrum that there's not a lot. I mean, the, the progress will be inspected at the sprint review. This is like the, there's not much to be inspected during the sprint itself from, from our perspective. Of course, it's especially irrelevant for the development team. But this is why there's this sprint rhythm. When you, you do something, you have this loop of loop, feedback loop. And then you present something and then you get feedback and then do the next loop, do the next sprint. So this is why the, um, the product backlog is much more important than inspecting something in between. It Actually, it's not a lot to be inspected. You know, it's more or less, uh, okay, what's, what's happening? Are things progressing well? But it's, it's, not, it's not the focus in Scrum. You, you inspect the, the sprint outcome. You inspect the, the, the product increment as a sprint outcome. You inspect the product backlog. Okay, and we also have Mamta. Let's see. Hi, Valentin. Hi, can how you are you? Hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank nice of you. you to join. Yeah, I sent you the questions already, but I think we are already over time, so I'm not sure if I if I can pick maybe one or two out of that. Yes, please go uh, ahead. But but definitely. Oh, thank you. The first question that I have is. Uh, this is, I think, in one of your practice tests, the development team does not have the know-how tools and infrastructure to complete the work on the product increment. Mm -hmm. What should the Scrum Master do? So I chose this answer, which says, um, coach the development team, improve its know-how tools and infrastructure over time. This is what I chose. But I think mm -hmm. there is another additional answer, which is you use the next sprint retrospective to adapt the definition of done. Mm -hmm. Now, I was a little confused here and I said, how would definition of done would help to, uh, you know, if you, if you don't have any technical know-how or mm -hmm. you don't have the right infrastructure to develop, how would DOD helps in that? So I think that's my first question. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And often like, um, like a weird part of Scrum, but this describes actually a realistic scenario where obviously the developer team is having issues building a product increment that adheres to the definition of done. So if, if they don't have the know-how, they don't have the tools to complete work on the product increment, it means that the product increment is not done. So something is missing. Now, of course, this is not ideal, but at the same time, you cannot like simply say, okay, what do we do? We we don't use Scrum anymore. We cancel all the sprints and everybody goes home. So this is not like the, the approach to do, um, to do Scrum. And of course, the best approach is always to have the development team improve the know-how, know tools and infrastructure over time so that they get better 
it's only by working at you know as you with scrum you you come in the beginning of the course you're not really ready to uh, to take the the exam but you're still improving yourself uh, over time so this is what the underlying idea here in the question is as well the development team is not ready right now but it will get better over time now in order to get it ready right now as i said previously the definition of done is currently worthless because whatever the development team does it cannot reach that the requirements that are inside the definition of done so for that reason it would make sense right now to adapt the definition of done like let's say to make it less strict so that there's transparency over what's actually being done so even if you have like a lower quality definition of done it's still important to have like a starting point and then to build some product increments that adhere to this lower definition of done of course what the development team is building is not going to have the highest quality but they are still building something they're still building something it's still transparent what done means even if it's not so good in quality there's still something can be released if the product owner thinks this is the right opportunity the stakeholders can still inspect this and then having this definition of done that is respected even if it is very weak but you know what has been done so far adheres to the definition of done then you can later on improve skills improve know-how improve tools infrastructure and at the same time adapt the definition of done so you can see the definition of done as growing with the development team itself it's important to know that it doesn't help to have a strict definition of done and no product increment is adhering to that so that no, that makes sense valentine yeah. i think i my my confusion probably was because when you do the sprint planning meeting so that's where you are figuring out how you are going to do this work and at that point of time maybe uh, you know you may not pick on few items because you don't have either the te technical know how of how to do it or maybe you don't have the right infrastructure so you may not pick those product backlog items so that's why i was confused mm -hmm. that in spite of doing that activity which you would have done in the beginning of the sprint you pick the right number of product backlog items knowing that yes you know how to do it and now during the sprint execution you are kind of getting stuck right so that's where i was coming from okay but just just to clarify the product owner will not order the product backlog no the, the 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 role of the product owner is to order product backlog to maximize value to be like very strict on the scrum guide so things as know-how or tools and infrastructure should not influence the product no. i know that this happens it may happen in practice but strictly talking in in terms of scrum and for the exam this is these are not criteria that can influence the product owner so and also the developer team will not cherry pick items from the product backlog it will also always select from the top of the backlog uh, in order the respective items J just just wanted to clarify it doesn't uh, doesn't mean that you said okay. anything wrong okay okay, okay. and the other question is um, uh, this is a very simple question i know but sometimes confuses who is responsible for estimating product backlog items and it mm -hmm. says select the most appropriate answer so i selected the development team alone Mm -hmm. that was my answer but i think the wrong the right answer is the development team with input from the product owner but mm -hmm. when it comes to responsibility even scrum guide says that it is the development team who is responsible for the estimates yeah. that's absolutely correct and this is what it says also in the correct answer it doesn't say that the product owner is responsible um that one is a better answer because the development team you will not you will rarely have the development team alone looking at a product backlog and starting estimating things so typically what you would have is you will have a product backlog refinement meeting and during that meeting the product owner will also come with let's say new product ideas and will look for input from the development team like discussing how can we build this does it make sense right now um as is there any way like to reduce the complexity do you have any idea so it's a collaboration process and this is what this option is trying to tell you it's trying to tell you well yes the development team is responsible it doesn't say that the product owner is responsible for this it would definitely be wrong but it says the development team does this estimates 
but with information coming from the product owner. The product owner is the one that has created the product backlog items that are being estimated. So this is why it's important to have this input from the product owner in order to, uh, in order to do the estimates. And also the product owner you know, may, may ne negotiate if, if uh, he or she feels that you know, it's, your estimate is quite high. Why is it so complex to right. build this? Can I change something? You know, we're building payment methods. I don't know. Maybe it's easy to do, first of all, an implementation with PayPal than to accept credit cards. Just as an example, like a, like a technical thing. So this is why the input from the product owner is very important. This is why this is the better option there. Okay. And now one more, uh, Valentin, yes. if I could. Uh, so uh, the Scrum Master in a newly formed organization in, is designated with helping form multiple Scrum teams from mm -hmm. a larger group of people. How should the Scrum Master proceed? Now, when I looked at this multiple Scrum teams, I immediately thought of a Scrum team which, cons which composes, which constitute of Scrum Master, product owner, and development team. However, the answer which is the right answer here, it actually hints that it means a development team in this case. So the right answer is ask the developers to find a way to divide themselves into teams. Um, that, in my view, is the right answer if it was multiple development teams. But because it was written multiple scrum teams, I did not choose that answer. I chose create a skill matrix and use it to create the teams, which obviously is a wrong answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was confused when I saw multiple scrum teams. So I was, so I think my, my question was that if in the exam, we see scrum team written like this in this context, should we assume that it means development team? What are the tips that you well, can offer? We well, need to understand that the scrum team is at the same time also like it, it contains the development team. So mm -hmm. if you have, um, let's say, you're, you have a group of people, let's say they're developers or not, doesn't, doesn't necessarily really matter. And you want to form multiple teams, but they are working on the same product. Well, first of all, no matter how many teams you form, they will still have the same product owner. And the only difference between the development team and the scrum team is actually the product owner and the scrum master. So we already know that they will have the same product owner. So uh, in the end, the difference is uh, which one is the scrum master. And especially if you're talking about a larger group of people, the product owner and the scrum master, they're not relevant necessarily for this because they will form, a, um, you know, the, the developer team has much, the, the number of members is much larger. So for that reason, when you have the development teams, it will be relatively clear how the scrum teams will look as well. So I would say maybe it's not 100% like accurate, but you could use them interchangeably when we're talking about forming teams. Okay. And everything in the end comes down to self-organization. So whenever you have a group of people that need to be divided, there's nobody calling, uh, making the decision on this one. It's not the management. There are no specific tools, as you mentioned, like using skill uh, metri metrics or anything else that, you know, you have the group and uh, what typically happens, you have somebody uh, as a scrum master uh, explaining what is the need for this. For example, look, you have 50 people, but, you know, we, we need to have uh, smaller manageable uh, sizes. So, um, this is why can you find a way to divide yourself in uh, uh, in this and also inputs to such a such a conversation are okay what are we building what's the product vision what's what's going on so now to have understanding what kind of skills do we need to do if we need to build a back-end application then you know it's not so important where the front-end work happens or or whatever or how the teams are structured so this is why the idea is give the information up front what are the boundaries what's needed and what are we building? And then let the group self-divide. Sure. And now the only one more last question. Mm -hmm. uh, is product backlog refinement usually a part of sprint planning or is it supposed to be done before you come in sprint planning? And who decides if they need a backlog refinement meeting? Mm -hmm. Well, you first need to remember that the product backlog refinement meeting isn't a prescribed Scrum event. Um, so what it means is it's totally up to the Scrum team and to be more specific, um, 
up to the product owner. So the product owner typically has this need to get feedback from the development team and to understand the size of the product backlog items because uh, with this estimate, the product owner may decide based on the size, this is too much. The, the, the benefit that I'm getting from this uh, is more than the cost that I'm investing in, uh, in building this most likely. So this is why you always have the product owner initiate this kind of um, product backlog refinement sessions. It, they are not mandatory in Scrum, so they can happen anytime or they cannot happen at all. If they are not needed, if everything is crystal clear, as you said, the development team can simply do this work with the product owner during the sprint planning meeting uh, and look at the product backlog, clarify anything that is unclear and simply create a new sprint based on, uh, based on that information and ensure that all criteria are, um, are met, like having an estimate, having a description and so on. So this is why the Scrum Guide isn't like super specific regarding where need, where something needs to happen, what's going on, and uh, things like this. So hopefully that answers your final question. Yeah, it does. Thank you so much, Valentin. Okay, you're more than welcome. All right, so we are almost one and a half hours into this. So thank you all for joining. Um, you had a lot of great questions and uh, as always, I'm more than happy to help. So if you have any questions um, till we can have the next webinar, feel free to reach out in the Q&A section. If you are already in the Q&A section, make sure you search for existing questions because there are already a lot of topics that have been discussed already. But just in case something is unclear, feel free to reach out ask in the Q&A section, send me a private message. And generally, if you attempt the exam, feel free to reach out, let me know how the exam went. If there's anything in the course that is no longer accurate, if you have any issues, and I'll be more than happy to hear from you. Thank you all for, for being here, and we'll see you next time.